Greetings from the eastern slopes of the North Cascade Mountains. It has been really, really stupidly hot here. Down in town, it's been something like 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which I'll let you figure out in Celsius. Um, so I'm up here uh, about 3,000 feet vertical higher, about 1,000 meters higher, because the temperature has dropped by a considerable amount. Uh, it's still early in the morning, so you can get my run in. But I thought, since we're here, we might as well talk a little bit about the unit desk and those paintings of M.C. Escher. Now, full disclosure, um, a full discussion, um, the geometry of Escher's work kind of requires uh, a bit of metric geometry, <laughs> Riemannian geometry, which we're not going to cover today. Instead, I'm going to kind of couch our discussion in what we've been talking about, that is SL2R as a subgroup of SL2C. So to that end, we're going to sketch three easy proofs today, the first two of which you can think of as kind of constructive in a way uh, to review the material that we've been going through quickly. Uh, and then the third one will get us to a discussion of those famous little discs. But first, uh, a quick apology <laughs> to everybody for taking so long. It's, it's been busy, I've been busy, but I've been up to good, I promise. I'll, do you, I'll give you more details uh, at the end of the video, but suffice it to say, uh, I've relaunched a couple of websites, in particular my own personal website, which has notes that it's going to accompany these proofs, uh, and I'll link to it uh, downstairs in the description. Okay, let's go. that the group SL2C acts transitively on the Riemann sphere. That is the complex plane uh, with one point compactification, the North Pole at infinity. To prove that, we start with a slightly easier result, namely that GL2C, the general linear group, you know, all invertible two by two complex matrices, uh, acts transitively on the vector space C2. And that's easy enough to prove. You take your favorite vector in C2, let's say a column vector 0 and 1, uh, and then you can construct a matrix, any matrix G, that takes that vector to any complex number you like, say alpha with beta, uh, you know, so in this case an upper triangular matrix will work. And since that matrix is invertible by definition, <laughs> uh, almost, uh, you can see how you can get from any one point in C2 to any other point in C2 um, uh, by simply taking matrices and their inverse. Uh, I should say, I've been talking this whole time about non-zero vectors in C2. Freezing mountain water. Okay, so GL2C is transitive on the non-zero vectors in C2. Um, so in particular, we know that the Riemann sphere is just the quotient of the non-zero vectors in C2 by the complex numbers themselves. That is to say, we identify all vectors in C2, except for zero, uh, that are linearly dependent. Uh, and that gives us the Riemann sphere sphere. <laughs> the one-point compactification of the complex plane, however you want to think about it. I'm dancing right now because of mosquitoes. So GL2C is therefore transitive on the Riemann sphere. Great. One more thing. Because the Riemann sphere viewed as the complex projective line, the quotient that we just discussed, doesn't care about scalar values, we can always feel free to divide such a vector out by the determinant of such a matrix, which means that the action of G in GL2C is equivalent to the action of some G in SL2C. In other words, because of the projective nature of the Riemann sphere, we are able to say that SL2C acts transitively on the Riemann sphere. Great, proof, done. So, right, remember a little bit of the context that we've been discussing. Good, next. <laughs> Since we've been talking so much about subgroups of SL2C, you might wonder if a subgroup of that transitive SL2C action kind of acts in a special way 
on a subset of the Riemann sphere. Indeed, this is the case. As you might recall, we've been considering the upper half plane, which is simply the open set of the complex plane with strictly positive imaginary components. A subgroup we've been talking a lot about is SL2R, which is the two by two uh, matrices uh, with real components that have determinant one. So our next claim is that the subgroup SL2R leaves the upper half plane, which is a subset of the Riemann sphere, invariant as a subspace. To prove that, the first thing we need to do is recall our coordinate patches for the Riemann sphere in terms of C2. Notably, we're gonna be considering, you know, the Northern Hemisphere patch, which gives us a column vector that looks like a complex number Z and one. And whatever we do to this column vector, we wanna keep the bottom element equal to one. So we act with an element of SL2R in this case, you know, matrix ABCD. ABCD acting on this vector gives us a z plus b c z plus d but we want to keep that lower component one so we pull out that automorphic factor that one over c z plus d uh, and that gives us the fractional linear transformation in the upper component right a z plus b divided by c z plus d the so-called mobius transformation that we've been discussing and that's how you get an sl2 r action on on the upper half plane where z is assumed of course to be in the upper half plane note that this is always a well-defined thing to do because the automorphic factor that one over cz plus d um you know is always uh non-infinite doesn't diverge right because cz plus d does not equal zero in in the upper half plane good okay so now all you need to do is consider the imaginary components of this mobius transformation and look what you get that's right you get a, B, a, D minus B, C, the determinant divided by some positive number times the imaginary part of Z. The imaginary part of the Mobius transformation of Z is proportional to the imaginary part of Z, which tells us that the upper half plane is mapped to the upper half plane. Positive gives you positive values of the imaginary component. Good. Okay, so that is done. Proof complete. Next. <laughs> We're going to be considering a transformation uh, of matrix elements of SL2R, uh, specifically conjugation bias, particular matrix C. It's called the Cayley transform. So uh, C is a matrix. It's not in SL2R. In fact, it has determinant 2i. It is the matrix 1i, uh, 1, and minus i. Um, we're going to be conjugating uh, elements of SL2R by it, but we'll find out that that just gives you another group that's homomorphic to SL2R because C acts a very interesting way on the upper half plane. So this brings us to our third and final claim for the day and perhaps the new novel thing for you folks. And that is that the matrix C as a linear transformation or a Mobius transformation maps the upper half plane to the unit disk. Uh, and moreover, that map is a homeomorphic. <laughs> Consider the action of C on the upper half plane variable Z, right? So now we're doing Mobius transformations again. And what do we get? Z is mapped to the fraction Z minus I over Z plus I, which in the upper half plane anyway, is holomorphic. The first thing you might want to investigate when investigating this transformation, this Cayley transformation, is to ask, okay, what is the magnitude of the transform vector? So the modulus of CZ is given by mod Z squared plus one minus the imaginary part of Z twice divided by mod Z squared plus one plus the imaginary part of Z twice. And so now you see why the upper half plane is so interesting, right? In this case, because this number is strictly less than one because the imaginary component of Z is strictly positive. So in other words, this holomorphic map takes the upper half plane somewhere into the complex plane that's bounded by the unit circle. Now this is where the proof gets sketchy and I'll let you take limits and be careful about identifying points and so on, but consider the case where Z approaches the real line, the boundary, if you like, of the upper half plane, 
when z becomes real, <laughs> the modulus of cz becomes one in all directions. So in effect, what you actually have, and, and you can show this pretty easily by taking limits and so on, is that um, it maps the real line, the, the Cayley transformation maps the real line to the unit circle. And, and this is probably not, no big surprise, right? Because infinities and so on are kind of in our mind <laughs> in some sense, because we've been talking about the upper half plane as a subset, uh, <laughs> an open subset of the Riemann sphere. And so, of course, you can map open subsets to open subsets uh, in a homeomorphic way via a holomorphic map. It's no big deal, right? Just taking a little circle and squishing it down, kind of moving it a little bit. But interestingly, the unit imagined number i becomes the center of the unit disk under the Cayley transformation. And so because the map is holomorphic, <laughs> you can actually see how the entire uh, unit disk is filled out by the upper half plane, um, which is cool. Let's try to discuss why it's cool. You can go and show that SL2R acts transitively on the upper half plane, but that's not as interesting perhaps as examining the behavior of some one parameter families uh, of subgroups, if you like, uh, in SL2R. So in particular, you can consider uh, the rotations, SO2, you know, cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine. Um, and you can also consider the scaling transformations, you know, given by e to the lambda and minus e to the lambda diagonal matrix. Last time we kind of sketched for you, and, and you can quite easily look at it, that the action via Mobius transformation of a rotation matrix gives you these kind of weird oblate uh, circles <laughs> in the upper half plane. In other words, the orbits of the rotations get squished into the unit interval on the imaginary axis between i and, and zero, uh, and they go all the way out to infinity at the top. Um, and similarly, if you want to do a scale transformation, you can start at i uh, and go out to infinity, e to the lambda, or you can go down towards zero, but you'll never get to zero, e to the minus lambda, because it's an exponentially vanishing thing. And so that gives us the hint that something funny is happening near the boundary, near the real line on the upper half plane. Um, and that something funny has to do with metric geometry, right? Calculus. I won't get into the details here, but suffice it to say that the notion of distance grows uh, inversely with the distance from the boundary, from the real line. I mean, I guess. <laughs> Uh, it's a better story for another time. But let's consider how the orbits of the rotation matrix and the scale matrix behave under the Cayley transformation. That is to say, under conjugation by C. Notice that they kind of flip roles here, right? So we've got a phase rotation on the diagonal from rotations. That's how that get mapped. And then the scale transformations get mapped to cinches and coshes. Uh, and so ultimately what we have here is the rotations are now very, very nice in the unit disk um, because they're circularly symmetric, unlike the case of the Mobius transformations in the upper half plane. So really what we're doing here is by mapping from the upper half plane to the disk is changing our model, changing our coordinate system, changing our, if you like, kind of nonlinear frame of reference. Um, and the complex numbers are really convenient for this because they make it so easy to do. Okay, so the upshot of this change of model, as we've discussed, is that the concept of distance in the upper half plane <laughs> gets mapped to the concept of distance in the unit disk in such a way that the real line now becomes the boundary, the closure, if you like, of the open disk. Uh, so Escher's paintings have uh, what you might consider like a uniform tiling, whether they're angels and demons or fish or whatever you have used in black and white squares. Um, and they're all supposed to have the same size. It's a uniform tiling, but because the distance shrinks as you get closer and closer to the boundary. The uniformly sized tiles appear to us from the outside as getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and so that is, I know, in some sense, uh, an introduction to Escher's circle limit paintings uh, that, that he did. <laughs> launched my own personal website and the Poseidon Institute website and particularly the latter I'm really curious what you think I have launched a new version of my field guide to particle physics <laughs> I'm doing it in kind of a smaller cuter yeah, more um, public friendly way uh, definitely asynchronous so uh, I'm curious what you might think about that so if you're interested in particle physics as a general audience um, 
short posts. I'm gonna turn them into podcasts. I'm gonna turn them into videos in due time. But in the meanwhile, I put the scripts online to share. Um, also, I've started formally writing up notes for our discussions that we've been having uh, in the context of applied representation theory, which is a course specifically designed for physicists and people who are looking to become physicists. Uh, it's done in a narrative style, uh, so it's not formal. I know a lot of you folks are mathematicians and you like formality, but for those of you who are physicists and want to bridge that gap between kind of the undergraduate education and what's needed for graduate school, um, I thought that this might help you out. So I'm curious, uh, it's still kind of beta testing it. <laughs> let me know, let me know what you think. Uh, and then third and finally, there's been a lot of discussion around kind of more professional friends of mine that are interested in a course in quantum mechanics, specifically focused on folks that maybe have some calculus, maybe have some experience with Excel or matrices or whatever, uh, and want to get into the nitty gritty because quantum computing is coming, uh, it's coming, it's coming to a data center near you. At least Amazon would like us to think so. So. Um, so I'm putting that together. I just launched the first one. So three open courses, completely open source, open for everybody. Um, I, I put some exercises down. I will get around to answering them. Again, I'll make videos. I'll do some other kind of material around them. But for now, I've just put the notes online uh, for you to check out. I'm curious. Feel free to give me comments, you know, if, if you have time. Uh, I, I think the feedback would really help make the course stronger. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. What, what have you been up to? How's your summer going? Or if you're down under, what's your winter like? Let me know. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna go run home before I melt or get eaten alive by mosquitoes. So, talk to you soon.